Um, I am really excited uh, to introduce um, Molly Shell. Um, I had the privilege of playing with Molly uh, when we were younger on Team Illinois hockey. Molly was much smaller. She was like 12 years old. We called her Little Molly. Um, she is no longer little. Um, from there, she both grew uh, vertically in height and to amazing heights as a hockey player. Uh, she attended Deerfield Academy, played for the BC Eagles, and then played for the U.S. national team and won two silver medals, one in Sochi, one in Vancouver, and four IIHF World Championships. Her neck probably hurts from all those uh, medals when she wears them. Um, she continued going up in the world where she returned to Boston uh, for a bit and joined the Boston Team Sports Club Monday Night Rec Team um, named Shut Your Five Hole. Uh, Molly played both forward and defense there, and her cat-like instincts and incredible hand-eye coordination really added to the team. Uh, she's an all-out great athlete in person, and I'm super excited to have you, Molly. So I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you share your stories. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, really excited to be here today. I've been following Karen and UWs for years now, and I had a chance to... Uh, coach one of their clinics at a YMCA a couple of years ago. And it, it was an incredible experience and I love what they're doing. So any chance to get involved and talk with other female or other goalies, other players, and just share our stories together, I think is really important. It's such a wonderful small community and very grateful to, to Karen for bringing me on tonight. So let me share my screen with you. Um, so as Karen mentioned, uh, so I played ice hockey my whole life. I went back and dug up this photo of me playing ball hockey. I don't know the audience officially on this uh, on this call, but I know we have a wide range of age, uh, skills, ice, roller, ball. So this is young Molly, where I fell in love with playing goalie. Um, and just to go back a little bit and some of my story. So I grew up in Minnesota. Um, so I had a pond in my backyard. I had two older brothers. So they I learned to skate as soon as I learned to walk. And when I was about six or seven years old, I really wanted to play with my older brothers and they really did not want me to play with them. And so after begging time after time, uh, they finally said, fine, if you play goalie, you can play with us. And I said, absolutely. And I jumped at the chance and I became a goalie for the rest of my life. Uh, we moved to Naperville, Illinois, where I started playing hockey for the first time, as you can see. From there, I joined the Naperville Sabres, which was our local team. Um, as Karen said, uh, this is where we met up. That's little Molly. I was about 12 years old playing for Team Illinois. Definitely wasn't on angle there, but and my glove and blocker are ginormous. But that's, that's really where I fell in love with it and started playing. My family moved to Boston. And as she mentioned, I played for Deerfield Academy for three years. And I also played for Assabet Valley during that time. Um, went on, like she said, to play at Boston College for four years under Katie King Crowley and Courtney Kennedy, who are both uh, U.S. Olympic medalists, which for me was a dream come true. Um, fortunately, after my junior year of college, I was named to the 2010 Olympic team where I competed in Vancouver. Then I took a leave of absence, came back, graduated. Um, I played two years in the Canadian Women's Hockey League for the Boston Blades while I was training for the 2014 games um, and did that. And then I finished off with the 2015 World Championships uh, in Sweden. And I was about 25 years old and said, I think it's time to move on uh, and, and move on with the next step of my career. So I've played at every stage. Um, I've loved it since I was six years old and I've been out of it for about five or six years now. So just to be back tonight and talking goalie and getting to know all of you is, is really exciting. Um, life after hockey for me, uh, as you can see on that one photo, Karen dragged me into her three on three Ironman tournament where I gathered my family and friends and we were team Ireland. And I've never been in such good shape as when I played ball hockey. I loved it. <laughs> it, it was so much fun and something I really enjoyed doing, um, after I was done competing. After that, I actually took a job with the Anaheim Ducks in the NHL and I spent the last five years out in Southern California, growing their school and education outreach. Um, so one of my main jobs was to grow street hockey in a non-traditional hockey market. 
So we worked with mostly fourth graders, but wrote a curriculum for K through six. And we got about 17,000 kids playing street hockey at their schools every year. Um, we built street hockey rinks on campus. So that was a really great chance to get connected within Southern California. And I think I saw Beth on this call. I got to know her and joined in in some SoCal ball hockey. Um, and I've really enjoyed doing that out here. Just these past six months, I actually started my own company with our Olympic strength and conditioning coach called Movement in a Box. So I've pivoted out of the hockey world a little bit and we started a subscription box that combines fundamental movement with learning activities for kids ages three to six to try to get kids more active at a young age and therefore provide more choice as they get older in sports and activity. So that's a little bit about myself boring I know so we're going to move into the fun stuff and why you're all here. Um, we'll definitely leave time for questions but please and maybe Karen you can help me with this don't hesitate raise a hand go off mute just blurt them out. Um, I want this to be as casual as possible and obviously talk about what's important to all of you. So to start people always say goalies are weird. I don't know where that comes from. These photos don't help our cause but uh I think I've, I've tried my best throughout life to make sure I, I combat that statement. Um, but I do think we're a little bit weird to stand in net and, and take shots at 80 miles per hour sometimes. But as you can see from these photos, we also like to have a lot of fun. I think I was very fortunate to have a couple of goalie partners um, and Bree McLaughlin and Jesse Vetter for almost six or seven years. And we just loved to be together, which I know is very rare sometimes, but it made it a really great experience. Um, so yeah, we ran track races. I was walking through the streets of Zurich, Switzerland and training for uh, summer camp out in Minnesota. So just a quick overview. We'll talk a little bit about practice habits, game management, some goalie tips and tricks. And I know we have some forwards and defense on this call. So I'll talk a little bit about shooters as well. Uh, a little bit of off, off ice training, but more, most importantly, I want to talk about what you want to hear. So we'll get to questions and answers as soon as possible. Um, so first, practice habits. Um, I think you get the dreaded another night of practice. Kids are on the ice, you know, four or five times a week now. But what I really tell the goalies I work with is it's super important to own your own development. At the end of the day, you are the one responsible for getting better. It's not up to your coach. It's not up to your teammates or your parents. Every time you go to the rink is a chance to work on something and it's up to you to make that happen. And so what I challenge the goalies I work with every time they step on the ice is to just pick one thing they wanna focus on that night to get better at. And just the other night I asked a 12 year old, I said, what do you wanna work on? And she said, everything. I was like, I appreciate that, but in one night, I don't know if it's possible to get better at everything, but let's focus on one thing we can get better at. And for her, it was glove saves that night. So everything we focused on was working on gloves. And at the end of practice, you can look back and say, did I do a good job of that? And it's that measurable goal you're looking for. Another thing is to master the fundamentals. I know when I was a kid, um, I would get put out there in goalie gear and I had to do all the power skating, just like the forwards and defense. And sometimes that wasn't fun. I'd fall down trying to do crossovers or, you know, I couldn't keep up with them always, but it made me a really good skater. And I always encourage the goalies to jump in the drills and, and just get, become a better athlete, become a better skater. Cause the more you can move around the crease, the better you're going to be. And so really there's no secret to success. It's mastering the fundamentals day in and day out and learning how to repeat those and become consistent. So even at the Olympic level, we'd spend the first five to 10 minutes just doing skating drills and making sure um, our footwork was good, that we are leading with our head and then our hands, um, that we are tracking pucks, everything like that. And then we would do stick saves for 10 minutes and it just seemed monotonous but is getting into that rhythm, getting the body warmed up and really making sure we mastered the fundamentals so then we could take the next step and work on our game from there. Um, we, when I was a kid, we were taught the three rules of goaltending. And for us, that was uh, always keep your chest centered on the puck, always keep your stick on the ice 
And then I apologize to all the forwards out there, but the third rule was forwards are stupid. And that's what we were taught at a young goalie camp. And the reason behind that is that goalies have to think the game more and goalies are never gonna give up on a play. And he showed us so many clips where it looks like a, a forward has the goalie beat, wide open net, and the goalie might dive back and make the save with their stick or with their glove because they don't give up. And so we would get drilled into us, uh, chest centered on the puck, for, sticks on the ice, and forwards are stupid. So you can take that as you will, but I do think there's, there's some truth to that, uh, speaking as a true goalie. And then the other thing I think, especially as you get older and you're practicing a lot more, how do you create competition within a practice? Um, I know a lot of kids get on the ice and they just get shelled with shots for 60 minutes and they get off. Um, and they're not really sure if they got better that day. And so a couple different tricks that I used to use, um, and this is something you can talk to your coach about, but we do it in every practice. Depending on the drill, after every shot, we count down from five seconds. And so a shot's made and I'll stand in the corner and I'll yell five, four, three, two, one. And it adds that competition with the forwards and the defense to play out every shot. Instead of just making the save, it goes to the corner and you go to the next one. It teaches you to follow your rebounds, to compete, to cover the puck, to talk to your defenseman. And it makes it a lot more game-like. So that's that's a really fun way at goalie clinics or to talk to your coach and pick one or two drills a day where you can make it that live action. Um, Cause it benefits the forwards too. When they score, they get really excited and it, it's a lot more fun. Um, another game I would play, I would pick a player and I would just say, you're not going to score on me today. And I might tell them that depending who the player was, I would verbally tell them that. And then it was a fun competition throughout the whole practice or it's just a mental note. I would tell myself, um, and it just adds a little bit of pressure to practice and makes you stay a little bit sharper and more focused, especially as they come down. Um, another one I would do, especially during warm up drills, when they had long shots, I would love to track how many rebounds I can control. And that's how I could tell if I was locked in. And so if they shot from out far and I was able to smother it, catch it in my glove, trap it with my blocker, you know, keep it right in front of me. I would pick it up and put it on top of the net. And at the end of the warm up drill, I could look back and say, all right, I have 10 pucks on top of the net or I have four pucks. And it was a good way to gauge just how focused and locked in I was in a very measurable way. My coach hated it because if I was doing well, that meant most of the pucks ended up on top of the net and she'd skate by and have to hit them off uh, to the corner to keep the drill going. But for me, it was a really good way to stay focused. And the other one that's uh, not on here, I would create a game for myself where if I let a goal in, because it's going to happen every game, every practice, to make sure I didn't let the next shot in. And that was starting to train my brain in practice to lock in every time I gave up a goal, right? They're going to happen all the time. It's how you react to it. And so that was a good way to start practicing those habits. Um, so if someone came in and scored, that next shot was not going to go in. So those are just a couple of ways that when you get on the ice to make the most of it, to own your own development, make sure you're mastering those fundamentals and then really come up with creative ways to stay engaged and to compete. So practices don't just drag on sometimes. Um, and I'd love to hear either now or later what, what some of you do to stay, uh, stay engaged during practice because everybody comes up with their own games. Um, Another topic is game management. So this is Ryan Miller, uh, I had to put him in. He just announced his retirement. He's the winningest American goalie of all time. And one of my heroes, cause he played for the Sabres and Team USA and the Anaheim Ducks, which was really exciting. Um, so as far as preparation goes, maybe in the chat, if you guys are willing, what's the difference between a habit and a superstition? If you're a player, if you're a coach, if you're a goalie, write down what's the difference between a habit and a superstition. Let's see. Go ahead and enter those. I know a couple of you must have them. All right. 
So for me, when I was younger, there we go. Habit is something you consistently and a superstition is something you believe. That's a good answer, Lindsay. Um, yeah, I love it. And so as goalies, I think we become creatures of habit and finding that routine that works for you. And there's definitely points uh, in my life where if I, I thought if I didn't listen to one song before a game, I'm not going to play well. Or if I didn't eat my peanut butter and jelly sandwich exactly an hour and a half before a game, I'm not going to play well. And those are superstitions, right? Things that are outside your control or that you think are going to make an impact on your game that really become a mental distraction. Whereas a habit is, you know, before the game, I visualize to uh, get into the right mind step or I love playing soccer before a game, but if I don't do it, that doesn't make an impact. Um, it's a lot to do with just your mental preparation and knowing that if you don't do it, you can still go out and compete. Um, when we were playing overseas at international tournaments, you know, we are so used to, you get to the rink an hour before the game and you have time to do X, Y, and Z and tape your stick. There'd be times where we show up to the rink a half hour, 20 minutes before a game, and you just have to put the gear on and go play at the highest level. And so being able to mentally prepare for that as a goalie, I think is super important. Another thing for me, um, you'll, you'll get a sense that I like creating mini games for myself, um, the game within a game. And so goalie's a really mental position. Obviously you're standing back there alone most of the time and have a lot of time to think. And for me to go out and play 60 minutes, or if you're a kid playing 45 minutes, Sometimes that's a lot to think about is for the next 45 to 60 minutes, you know, I have to be on the whole time and I can't, you know, I have to give my teammates a chance. And I don't want to give up a goal. And I wonder what coach is thinking and, and all these different things. For me, I broke it up into chunks um, later in my career. So I played five minute games, which made for four games a period. And whatever whistle happened after that five minute mark, I would take a quick skate, take a deep breath and say, all right, on to the next game, focus for the next five minutes. And I think that's something that forwards and defense get to do a lot. They get to have a shift. They get to go back to the bench and regroup a little bit. Goalies don't always have that. So if you can create that for yourself mentally, um, that's something really fun. And, and for me, it helped mentally just stay engaged and focused. Uh, funny story, we actually pitched our national team coach at one point and we said, what if you change goalies like you did forwards and defense? What if every couple shifts, the goalie switched? And so you did get to come out of the game, take a mental break and go back in. And she said, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> and then three games later, out of nowhere, three minutes into the game, she looked at me and said, Shouse, you're in. And I was like, all right. So I went in and three minutes later, Jesse Vetter came from the bench and we did that the entire game. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend it, but it was definitely a unique thing. Uh, I was impressed she gave it a try. I kind of liked it because like I said, you only had to stay focused for a shift or two, not give up a goal and then pass it to your teammate. But obviously there's a reason we don't do that, but it, it was definitely a fun experiment. Um, on the same line, managing your thoughts during the game. Um, I was taught this later in my career because I was definitely guilty of it sometimes. The pucks at the other end, and I might think to myself, I wonder what's for dinner tonight, or man, I really need to study for this test tomorrow, or I give up a goal and think, how am I going to explain that one to coach? And none of that was a good use of my time or energy or, or mental capacity. And so uh, later in my career, I learned breathing techniques. And so anytime the puck came into the zone as it was coming, I'd take a deep breath and reset. And that just cleared my mind before every face off, before every period. I would use those deep breaths to just reset. Um, the mantra was a really interesting one we, we picked up later in life. Uh, fun fact, your brain can only handle one thought at a time. And so if you tell your brain what to think, that's what you're going to focus on. And so as players would come in, they would say like, be, be big, stay out, compete whatever it is that is your mantra and what your strengths are, I just had them repeating in my brain throughout the game. Because if that's what I'm thinking about, my brain can't trail off and think about other things. Um, 
And so I even wrote it on my blocker for a couple of years. And before face off, you just look down and it was that reminder. Um, I definitely had have fun on there. I was a goalie that took things very seriously. So to remind myself, it's a game, have fun, smile, and then compete. Um, another thing is controlling the controllables. You hear that a lot in life. And so much of a goalie is actually having to react to what's going on in front of you. And you don't have a lot of control with that. And what I mean by that is refs are gonna make calls, players are gonna make mistakes, bounces are gonna happen. And you can't control uh, a lot of it. You can only control your, your reaction and, and how to manage it. And so a, a thing that our strength coach always said, or our mental skills coach, is you park it. You make a mental note, you might be frustrated, you might be mad, you might be upset about a goal or what your defenseman did or didn't do. You just tell yourself, park it. And then after the game, you come back and you can revisit those different uh, different ideas. And that's a good time to really digest and, and think about it more. But during the game is not the time to analyze it. And with that, uh, when it comes down to game time, throw away the rule book and just go out and compete. Some of my favorite goalies, uh, Ryan Miller, Jonathan Quick, Dominic Kashik, they just compete. They're never gonna give up on a play. They might be rolling around on the ground, throwing a blocker, but at the end of the day, the entire job is to keep the puck out of the net and coach doesn't care how you do it as long as you do it. And so don't be afraid to just compete um, when time for games. All right, so goalie tips and tricks. Communication. Uh, I know when I was young and I played with Karen, I didn't say a word in that. I was shy. I was quiet. I just wanted to stop the puck. And I had so many coaches who gave me a hard time about it and really taught me that I can be a sixth player out there. I can help the team. I can make a huge difference if I just open my mouth. And that's a really good lesson for young goalies is to help your teammates out. You're the only one looking out at the whole rink. Everybody else is backing up and having defenders on them. Take advantage of that and really communicate as much as you can. Um, something especially for older goalies, and we'll look at a couple of photos here, is how to play two-on-ones. And this also uh, correlates to power plays and really taking that next step and looking at which way the player is shooting. If a player is a lefty or a righty, that changes how you're going to play as a goalie. And so here's an example you can see of Detroit coming in and the player with the puck is along the boards and his stick is along the boards, which means the puck's further away from the net. So if you're a goalie, you like that, right? Because the puck's not in that prime scoring area. And then if you look at the player he's with, that player's a righty, which means, right, he can tap it in right there, but he can't take a one-timer. He's not gonna wind up. And so as you're analyzing this play, your eyes are on both of those people to determine the biggest threat. And if I'm a defense and you're communicating, I'm yelling, I have shot on this one because I like my chances there. So the defense is really trying to make sure the puck doesn't get across because to go from boards all the way over to that player is a really long pass and really hard for a goalie to get that far. But if you look at this play, uh, the player along the boards is the same, uh, same left shot, but the player in the center is a lefty as well. And so you can see he's getting ready to one-time the puck. Sometimes you see that player open up completely and shift their hips so they can fully wind up. But say, for example, his stick was still in front of him and he was just going to the net. You know he can't one-time it. You know he can't catch and shoot quickly. And so you can play that a little bit differently and talk to your teammates differently because of that. And then finally, in this situation, the puck carrier has the puck in the middle of the ice and is a much bigger threat. And so these are just three examples of two-on-ones. They all might look the same as you're coming down, but as you get older and start realizing which way players shoot, is that player going to the, hard to the post? Are they hanging back? Are they opening up for a one-timer? Those are all little parts of the game that can let you make a judgment call and that split second decision to um, give yourself the best chance of making that save. And the same thing goes for power plays. If you're a forward, coaches always tell you to make two-on-ones, right? And then attack the net. 
And so as a goalie, you're looking out and seeing, all right, where are the one-timer possibilities? Where can't they do a one-timer? Who's back post? Are they a righty or a lefty? Where's the biggest threat? And so really starting to analyze that is going to take you from that next step um, as you get older. Crease management. Um, I don't know about you, but I always hated when players would run or skate through the crease. And this is an interesting example. You can see in the photo, the player's hands are extended all the way from their body. It's going to be very difficult for them to shoot in that position. And so as you watch people's hands as they get close to the net, you can tell when they're a threat to shoot. But in this example, you know he's going to have to make a move or pull it back to be a threat. And so don't be afraid to challenge that more. You know he's gonna to try to beat you across the net and you have those defense coming back to help you. And if you play out this clip, the player does beat him to the back post and score a goal. Um, so really own that crease. If Don't let players skate through it. Don't be afraid to poke check or take that step out. Um, but really when you see those hands all the way out, you know they have to pass or make a move. When the hands are closer to the body, they have a lot more options and it's a much bigger threat. Um, I'm a little bit too old for the RVH, VH that everybody's being taught nowadays. Uh, we, we did some post loads uh, and I think it's up to every goalie to figure out what's best for them. I will say, especially for the little ones, if you're dropping down too soon, you are opening up a lot of the net. And so it's really trying to figure out the right time for you to do that. And you start seeing goalies that as soon as that puck enters that angle, they're automatically dropping. What forwards are learning is goalies are automatically dropping. So they're purposely aiming right over that goalie's shoulder um, or right at their head because they know that spot's gonna be open. So definitely use this, it, it works, but I'm, I'm a little bit more of the old school of hold your feet as long as possible. Cause once you go down, especially in ball hockey or roller hockey, it's very hard to move side to side. And so you want to keep your feet, keep your height as much as possible. Um, so that, just know the time and place and know that forwards are always trying to stay one step ahead of you. Now, rebound control, really, this is such a, a big word um, or big focus for goalies. When you get into a game, you really want to simplify everything. So every time you control a rebound is one less scoring opportunity for the other team. And a controlling a rebound could mean covering it, right? Catching it, smothering it. It could mean putting the puck into the corner with your stick, you know, directing it out of play. Or it could be, you know, all the pressures on one side and you kick a rebound out might not be a great rebound, but as long as you're putting it away from pressure and there's not a threat there, that's a safe place too. Um, the real danger, and we'll talk about it from the shooter perspective, is when those rebounds are in front. And so that's going back to practice habits. I never let a puck sit right in front of me, no matter what. I would either drop down and cover it, use my stick to push it to the corner, but really get in that habit of tracking a rebound right away. And then finally, puck play. I have to make fun of myself a little bit here. This is my brother's favorite gift. I uh, came out to play the puck and just biffed it, which totally happens, and they scored. It happens. Totally okay. But here's another goaltender, Mike Smith, who's one of the best goalies in the NHL at moving the puck. And nowadays, uh, especially for you young goalies out there, learning how to stick handle and get out of the net and make passes goes a long way. Coaches are looking for a player that's more dynamic and can be part of the whole team. If you watch Mike Smith highlights, teams don't get a forecheck going because he gets out, stops it, makes the first pass, and that just lets the team go on offense way quicker. So even when you're young, get out there and start shooting pucks, start stick handling, do all the drills that your forwards and defense are doing so that you can become really confident at moving that puck around um, it makes a huge, huge difference. But like I said, you'll make mistakes sometimes and that's okay. You get back up and you keep going. All right, onto the shooter side. So I wanna leave time for questions. And I know we have a couple shooters in here. 
And as Karen knows, I since moved to forward uh, after retiring from hockey. So I'm trying to learn from all of these as well. Uh, number one, shoot with a purpose. So as you're coming in, you have your head up. There are certain times where you're trying to pick that corner and, and snipe bar down. There's other times where creating a rebound is probably your better play. If there's a lot of traffic in front, if it's a two on one and you want to get it off the pad and over, um, it's really important to know the situation and, and choose your shot accordingly. Because there's nothing worse than coming in on a two on one, thinking you're going to pick the top corner and you miss wide. It hits the boards, goes around, and now you're back checking. Um, so shoot with a purpose. And then also look at a goalie's tendencies and goalies know that players are looking at your tendencies. Um, I would always watch during warmups and you see how far out does the goalie play? Are they at the top of their crease? Okay, maybe you'll deke if you get a breakaway. Are they playing a little bit back? All right, we're gonna shoot as much as possible. Same thing with their glove. Uh, if some goalies hold it up like this. The second I see that, I'm telling players to shoot right above the pad because that motion to get all the way down is hard. But if they have the hand more traditional, I might look and say, shoot somewhere else um, or shoot top glove. And so really starting to know your goalies, know if their five hole is bad, right? Five hole is really tough for a goalie if you're moving side to side. So start knowing their tendencies and shooting with a purpose based on what you see, instead of just coming in with your head down and shooting the puck as hard as you can. Another thing is to change the angle of attack. Uh, anytime you can make a goalie move side to side, your chances of scoring are a lot higher. Uh, there's a stat I read, if you come in on a two-on-one and shoot, I think you have a 3% chance of scoring. But if you make a move and either pass it or skate it across the midline of the rink, you're up to about a 35% chance of scoring. Because when goalies move, that's when the holes open up. And then even more subtly, just the release point. Um, I know with girls coming in, a lot of the times they have it, they pull it back. And as a goalie, I know they're going to shoot then. But the really good shooters are coming in, they hold it, and they might pull it into their body just six inches or push it out six inches to make you think and make you have to move just that little bit that might open up that hole. So whenever you're coming in as a shooter, you want to change the angle of attack right at the release point just to make it that much harder on the goalie to read. Um, another one is give yourself options. We talked about it earlier. When your hands are out in front of you, you have much fewer options. If you're skating with the puck on a breakaway, the hands are in front of you. As a goalie, I know you can't shoot. So really just being aware and giving yourself options as much as possible to pass, to shoot, to deke, whatever it is, it makes you unpredictable. And I think you saw in my earlier slide, as a goalie, you want to be predictable to your teammates, unpredictable to the opponent, and it's the exact opposite if you're a forward. Another thing is all goals count the same. So I know the goal, the forwards who like to come in and make the beautiful shot or deke. It, a goal is a goal no matter where you score it from. And in fact, 75% of NHL goals uh, in 2018-19 came from rebounds and half of them came within 20 feet of the net. And so if you watch how goals are scored, you can see the percentages of just being dirty in front of the net, screening, tipping, fighting for the puck, and it comes down to wanting it more than the defense or goalie. And that as a goalie should tell you the importance of controlling rebounds and covering the puck and eliminating those chances in tight. And then finally, backhand shots uh, as a goalie, those are the hardest to read. And so anytime, I know a lot of girls like to take the extra step of taking it from their backhand to their forehand. Sometimes just getting the puck on net when the goalie's not expecting it can create a lot of really scary plays for a goalie or a lot of really good opportunities for a forward. And so just all this together, um, putting the puck on net is always a great play. It doesn't have to be perfect. I know a lot of people are always looking for that extra pass, but you just never know what's gonna happen and force the goalie to make a play with that. And then finally, off ice training. And I know uh, Coach Karen and a couple others have done more in depth talks about this. So I won't get too far, but play other sports. Um, for so many reasons, playing other sports is important. 
as you can see, I was the kid out there with every sport on the lawn by age four, just hoping to play with my brothers. But by playing soccer, by playing softball, I learned hand-eye coordination. Um, I learned how to be more athletic. I learned how to be coachable by different coaches. Um, I had different roles, you know, in goalie or in hockey, I was the starting goalie. In soccer, I was, you know, the lowest on the totem pole and maybe played five minutes a game. And so you learn how to be a good teammate, how to play different roles, um, what your strengths are, and it gives your body a break. Um, I know for me playing goalie, I tried not to skate in the summer very much just to give my body a break uh, and, and recover. Visualization, you'll hear so much about it, but you're only on the ice a couple hours a week. And there's so many benefits from visualization and taking time every day to just calm down, close your eyes and think about something you wanna get better at and picture yourself doing it over and over and over. And I would do that before games. I would picture just making a clean save putting the puck in the corner, making that two-on-one read. And so many studies show how beneficial that is. And I'm, I'm sure there's other talks that can go way more in depth on that. Um, so much about a goalie is core strength and explosion. Very rarely in hockey are you on two feet at once. You're always pushing or sliding or pivoting or taking a step out. And so really working on that lower body strength and explosive uh, explosiveness and uh, helping the hips and knees because there's so much strain on that. So you wanna get as strong as possible. I know Coach Karen's talked a lot about recovery, um, but as you get older, that's also super important just to make sure you're warming up and stretching before and after um, because playing goalie is not necessarily a natural position for your body to be in, especially with the butterfly. And then finally, watch and learn. Uh, what, Fortunately, there's women's hockey on TV now, there's the NHL, there's colleges, especially after COVID. Watch as much hockey as you can and, and learn from other goalies. Everybody plays it a little bit differently, but and every coach is gonna coach you a little bit differently, but you can pick up little uh, bits and pieces from everybody and then go into practice and figure out what works best for you. Um, watch your favorite shooters, see how they release the puck, see you know how they make space for themselves, see how they screen. Uh, there's so many great role models out there that it's just uh, a great opportunity to get out and watch the game and you can learn so much. I still learn a lot from watching hockey. Um, so with that, I think we're on to questions. Yep. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. Honestly, I'm an open book. We can talk goalie. We can talk training, college, Olympics, storytelling, anything you want to talk about. I know we have probably 10 minutes here. Um, so please feel free to raise your hand, come off mute. We'd love to just have a talk amongst goalies and hockey fans. There's gotta be some. Well, fun story, going back to control the controllables. Uh, you've probably all been in the position where you show up for a game and coach forgets to tell you who's playing that game. Right, so you're mentally prepared to get out there and play and you're just waiting to find out. And so I was at the world championships in 2008. We were playing Canada in a round robin game but we had to win it to make it to the gold medal game. And it was technically my turn to play just based on the rotation but we were never told anything. So we got to the rink, we went on the ice for warmups and both Jesse Vetter and I both went to take the net. And I was like, are you playing? She goes, I don't know, are you playing? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, maybe we should find out. And so we went over to coach and the head coach was like, oh my gosh, I thought the goalie coach would have told you that like a day ago. And we're like, nope. And so he said, you know, Jesse, you're playing and she had to go out and win a game for us. And so it just goes to show you, uh, you always have to be ready to play, you never know. And I was actually shocked to find out um, 2011 Stanley Cup finals. If anyone remembers Boston Bruins versus Vancouver, uh, Vancouver came in, Boston had to win game five and six, and they played, uh, they pulled Luongo and played Corey Schneider. And so they're going back to game seven, Stanley Cup final of the NHL, and they showed up to the rink for game seven, not knowing who was going to start that game. Coach never told them. And Corey Schneider told us later that he had to assume it was going to be him, uh, but in the end, it wasn't. So as a goalie, we've all been in that position. And 
hopefully we have coaches who understand the, the importance of mental prep and telling you a day before, but uh, no matter what the circumstances, sometimes you just have to jump on the ice and compete and give your team the best chance to win. Holly, I saw you come off mute. Do you have a question? I did. Hey, Molly, this is super exciting. Thanks for spending your evening with us. This is wonderful. And thanks to Karen, San, and Jay for putting this together. Um, I know this is probably unique for all goalies, but I'm curious for you, Molly, in particular, when there was like a bad beat or just a rough play, what did you want to hear from your teammates? Like at, as soon as you sweep the puck out from the goal, what, were, what would make you feel better or what would get you refocused or what would you want to hear in that moment? Great question. I like that one a lot. Um, I definitely didn't like the pity party of like, oh, it's okay, or that's our bad. Um, we had one player who just look us in the eye and be like, all right, we'll go get that one back. We got you. Like, we have your back. We're going to go score a goal. And that gave me the confidence to say, all right, they haven't given up. I'm going to do my best to hold it right here and give them a chance. Um, so just that confidence of like, all right, we'll go get one back. I think for me was like, all right, let's do this. We're, we're in it together. Um, Cause yeah, there's nothing worse than that feeling of like everyone's at the bench and you're just standing there and sometimes nobody comes over and you're like, Oh shoot, <laughs> that could be worse. Um, but no, I, I very much appreciate teammates who kept it positive and just said, Hey, stick with us. We'll get you that one back. Great question though, Holly. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, any advice from switching from ball hockey? switching from ball hockey from ice hockey. I think um, I only, I've played ball hockey a little bit more as a forward. So there might be some other goalies on here who could answer this better. Um, but I think the key components are the same, right? The key fundamentals of tracking the ball, tracking the puck, communicating with your defense, competing, trying to keep the ball out of the net, no matter what. Um, I think the biggest transition for you, Hannah, it's going to be the footwork. Um, funny story, I tried inline goalie, my roommate plays, and I got out on the ice, and it was a two-on-one, and they made the pass, and I went to butterfly slide over, and I just stopped. And then I crawled on all four hands and knees to get to the other side, and of course they scored. Um, so really working on the footwork and understanding what those shuffles are and when to leave your feet is the biggest difference. And I think the ball might move a little bit more than the puck because it's lighter. Um, but yeah, Hannah, that's a great question. And I, I think uh, the things that will make you successful in, in both are, are pretty similar though. And it's really just having fun and competing. So I love it. Hey, Molly, thanks for having us. Um, curious about, you mentioned earlier, you know, being a goalie, you are kind of on, uh, you're kind of on an island on your own sometimes, right? And how would you recommend or what, what, tips could you give for to help incorporate goalies especially like within practices to be part of that team aspect of it you know I coach our, our young youth goalies and I know that's something we challenge you know because the praise goes to the forward for scoring and you know you put you see the goalie lets in the goal but they don't get all the praise <laughs> for making that glove save or as you say you know they they, they competed but how would you, what are some things we can do or parents and even coaches to try to incorporate them into the team as a whole? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do think in practice, it's almost more noticeable than games. Uh, there's so many times where they'd be like, all right, we're going to draw up this drill or we're going to talk D zone coverage. Goalies go down there. And all of a sudden you're standing down there while coaches explaining the drill you're like, wait a second, I should know what our D zone coverage is, or I should know what our power play is. And so I always felt it was super important to be part of all those chalk talks to really know what's going on. Because if I know what my D are being instructed to do, I can read off that then, and I can predict a little bit better or communicate with them better. Um, so I think at the very basic is just in include them in all team conversations. Don't make them like, oh, you don't need to know this. You can leave. Um, I also think creating so many drills and practice are geared towards forwards, taking a pause and creating a drill that helps a goalie learn whatever skill you're trying to work on that day for the goalie. Um, and even say to the players, all right, those four drills were to help you score. Those four drills were to help our D zone. 
we're doing this drill to help our goalie and um, especially at a young age and reward that and get the players understanding how important the goalie's development is too. Um, after a game, I'm sure most coaches already do this, but you know, you're not just giving a shout out, hey, awesome goal tonight. It's going around the room and, and recognizing things that might not show up on the score sheet. And that goes for all players, right? You know, I love the way you made that pass or I loved how you communicated and were a good teammate or even a goalie. Uh, it doesn't always have to be saves. It's, you know, I love that rebound controller. I loved how you slowed the game down. Um, but really finding a couple different things to point out, um, I think just to make them feel included. Um, if you have an assistant coach on the ice, have one of them be in charge of the goalies. And even if they don't know anything about it, having someone just to talk and acknowledge to the kid <laughs> goes a long way because there might be a practice where you don't hear a single word from your coach. And that's where it gets a little bit draining um, and isolating. So they're one of the team, treat them like you would any other kid on the team and, and provide the same feedback, I think is super important. Oh, I think I saw a, a hand from Sarah. Did you, were you giving a thumbs up to ask a question? No, okay. Um, we have one in, more in the chat. I think this will be our last one. How do you mentally recover from having a bad game? Um, that's super important and honestly can, can be hard. So I think it's really important to take a moment to self-reflect accurately. Um, you might give up five goals in a game and you played incredible. Like literally there's nothing you could do about those goals. Um, and sometimes you might give up one goal and you beat yourself up for it for a week because it was the simplest goal and something you could have been working on. So really being able to self-reflect on what you could have done better. Um, it's only a bad game if you don't learn from it and make adjustments for the next one. Uh, depending how bad, you know, it depends if you want to sulk in it and talk about it or go watch a show with your friends and not even think about hockey for a night. Uh, you know, you hear NHL players talk about just flushing that game away and showing up to the rink the next day and pretend like it never happened. There's also games where it's like, okay, I know I could do X, Y, and Z better. And this is my plan to do that at practice the next day um, is super important. But for me, I wanted to go back to basics. That next practice, I would grab a shooter and be like, all right, shoot five glove, five blocker, five on ice, just to get that feeling back of confidence and, and making a clean save. And then I felt a lot better to go. Um, but yeah, a deep breath, perspective always helped. You know, take a walk, get away from the rink, laugh with friends, laugh with your teammates. And then the next time you get to the practice, figure out what you can do better. But great question, Nicole. It's a game at the end of the day. And I didn't always, I, I was a very serious goalie. So I wish I could have told my younger self, it's a game, have fun. You're gonna win, you're gonna lose. Crazy things happen, um, but in, enjoy playing the game with your friends. I actually think we have time for one more if anyone has one more question. Open book. I think. Yeah, Hannah. What is your favorite kind of save? <laughs> so in practice, I always had a lot of fun messing around if a player was coming in where you do the two pad stack and you flip your pads over completely and try to stop it on the other side. I always like doing that and just messing around uh, doing that windmill. But in a game, I loved I love making the clean save. Like if you're playing well, you're not diving around the net a lot. It's very clean. And so I took a lot of pride in smothering pucks or any stick saves going to the corner. Um, so like the nerd in me really loved the simple saves, but if I'm in practice messing around the, the two pad stack windmill for sure. I love breakaways like shootouts. I would rather have a breakaway than go play the puck and I had have a lot of talks with my coaches about that as I got better at playing the puck. Um, but I, I love the shootout for sure. No, I love that. I think Todd, that's, that's awesome. hundred percent fun all the time. Um, you can only control your effort. You can't always control the outcome. Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great spot to end on. 
Um, I want to uh, extend a huge thank you to Molly uh, for joining us and for all this wisdom that you shared tonight. Um, we really appreciate you being with us. Um, I can stick around for a few more minutes, Molly. I don't know if you can, um, just in Definitely. case anyone has um, some questions. So I'm going to throw a link to a form in the chat. I uh, would love to hear your thoughts on how tonight went. If you have just a moment, it should take uh, about two minutes or so. Um, that would be fantastic. Um, if you have a few more um, questions, um, I can stick around with Molly just for a few minutes and, uh, and talk with you. Um, Otherwise, thank you. Have a fantastic evening. Really appreciate you all joining, listening, asking great questions, uh, and just um, being with us in community tonight. Thank you so much. It was wonderful talking with all of you. Good night.